chapter, isn't that something? If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at a few verses there, and we're going back to the house. Thank you all for coming back. Thank you all for wanting to be a part of the service tonight. I'm sure others, how about hitting that light switch up there, these lights over my head? Thank you. Hebrews chapter 11, we'll begin reading in verse uh, eight. We, what we want to do tonight is I, we want to talk about the trip that we have to take, the journey of life that we have to live and how that, how that can all work out and how that journey might very well be as we, if we've been embarked on it for quite a while. I, you know, I used to think when I was a young person, a younger person, I, I used to think that, wow, 70 years old, that's is pure ancient. If anybody lived to be 70 years old, they were really old. Amen. Well, we made it. Amen. Thank the Lord. <laughs> So uh, now I think 70 years old is, is quite young, to be, to be honest with you. But uh, So it, it's all, it all depends on what stage in we're at. Now, uh, we're going to look tonight at, at a gentleman called Abraham, uh, and at other times called Abram, uh, but he was always called the son of God and the child of God because uh, Abram found it very, uh, a very determined thing that he was going to obey God. And so that, that made things more pleasant for him. But I want to tell you, even though he was, had all this faith and he was willing to obey God, I want to tell you he, there were some bad days in his life. Uh, there were some times when he did things we didn't understand, uh, but he made it through. And, and so we're going to look back tonight. We're going to look at his, his life. We're going to look back at his journey. And then we can maybe, as we look at his journey, reflect on our journey and what, what's happened, what's going to happen, what could happen as we journey in Christian service. And, and there's not really a place, if you see in Abraham, and I think he's a good example for us to look at tonight, there's not a place that he really wanted to turn back. And, and so if you hold your finger in Hebrews chapter 11, and if you'll look in Genesis 12, you'll find there what God told Abraham to do. Uh, he just, uh, you know, God spoke to him and just said, Abraham, look here, uh, you, you got to pack it up. And get ready to go because I, I got a place that the Lord said to Abram, in Abram, verse 12, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless and so on and so And Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Iran. And that would be like the Lord, and, and I got a couple years to go, and he'd say, Tom, now look here, yeah, pack up, you get Judy, pack up, get away from where you are and go to a place that I'm going to show you. Well, of course, we know that Abraham did exactly. He left his homeland, went in, he, he went by way of Egypt, ended up, there was famine and stuff in the land, so he went over to Egypt, and then you know what happened over there. He, he told that, uh, that his wife was his sister and, and almost got the whole country in trouble over there and all that kind of stuff. Abraham, that was his journey, though, and that's, that's what I want you to see from the homeland to the promised land. That's what I want you to see because that's, that's exactly what happened with Abraham. From the homeland to the promised land. And, and along that journey, it was hard at times. It was very difficult at times, but he didn't give up on his journey. And neither can we. And we don't know what to expect around the corners. But we do know this, as God promised Abraham, that if he would go, he would show him the place and take him to a city whose builder and maker was God. And so Abraham believed God, and therefore, as we pick this up, listen to this in chapter, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker was God. See, that was the journey. Abraham had to go on that journey. Now, I don't know uh, when your journey began with the Lord. Don't know uh, what your life has altogether been like other than maybe what you've shared or maybe what we've seen and see how you live. Don't really know. But uh, one who does know is God. 
And, and when God, not, he didn't only create you and form you in your mother's womb, but God has a purpose for forming you. God had a purpose for forming all of us. God had his intentions when, when he made us male and female in his own image and in his own likeness. And he has a, a promised land for us, but he has a journey to the promised land. And that's what we call life. And that's what we live here. So as we've been studying in Ephesians on Wednesday night, we are learning how to live and walk in that life that we must live on our way and on our journey to the promised land from the homeland. We're on our way. We're there. We're going. And I want you to know uh, it, it's going to have some difficult days probably. It already has. It's going to have some mountains. I was thinking there uh, while our sister was singing that song, uh, the God of the mountain is still God in the valley. Uh, you know, if you think about that, when we're on top of the mountain and we're blessed, God's going to wash our blessing down to the valley where others abide. The blessing, our blessing on the mountain is going to be the blessing to those that are in the valley. It's not altogether bad to be in the valley. It's not altogether bad to have to walk there because because I'll tell you the most nutritious land in the whole mountain scene is the valley. It's there that all the nutrients wash down and wash into the valley where I'll tell you if we'll just stay there and not give up our struggle, but just stay there in the valley, we'll find just how nutritious those things of God become. Amen. We want, we want to get down and out and down in the mouth and, and feel pity and sorry for ourselves, but some, somehow or another we've got to find courage. And if you all through the New Testament, that's what we're admonished to do, uh, not to faint and not to give up and not to uh, droop and sag, but to, but to be upright and be strong and that God would never leave us. And he's given us all the promises and he told us that he would go with us and be with us. So we got a journey that we don't have to journey alone. Amen. See, those are the things we've got to learn. <clears throat> and, and, and the sooner we learn them, that's that knowledge we talked about this morning, the sooner we learn them, the better our journey will be. I mean, that, that's just the reality of it all. See, oftentimes, you know, like the people who came out of Egypt, they, a, lot, a lot of them died there. It was not God's intention for them to die in the wilderness. It's not God's intention for us, you to die in the wilderness. The wilderness is not a place where God has sent you. The wilderness is not a place where God took you from where you were so that he could send you there that you might die there. I want you to know God was not intending for his people to die in the wilderness. He had sent Moses to lead them to the promised land. They just rather want to love the wilderness more than they love going to the promised land. And they died there. How many people you reckon have died in the wilderness that, that God wanted to die in the promised land? How many of you thought, think about that kind of stuff? I mean, really, on a daily basis, think about how many didn't make it because the, the, the wilderness attracted them more than the promised land. And, and there, there are bukus and multitudes of people that are, are alive today. Uh, there are terrorists that rather take lives than go to, uh, to the promised land. Hey, listen to me. There, there are people that rather have the pleasures of this world and, and they never make it anywhere else. Uh, just to have all these things in this world. I'm going to tell you something. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. See, that's an old song we used to sing in the church. I'm tired of talking about what we used to sing. Let's bring it back and sing them again. Amen. Uh, they put blessing on the altar and blessing in the pew, blessing in the pulpit. And, and God, those things were, those things were uh, touched by God. Those things were inspired by God. I'll tell you, uh, we, got, we got men today writing songs that don't even know the God they're writing about. And so, but anyhow, Abraham, God spoke to him. That's how our journey begins. God speaks to us in our homeland. God speaks to us where we are. He doesn't take us to another place to speak to us. He speaks to us where we are. And he's speaking to you where, where you are this very day. He'll speak to you and communicate his will and his desire for your life to this very day. And, and so and that's what we've got to realize. He's not going to speak to you. He's not going to send you where I need to be. He's not going to send me where you need to be. But he's going to send us uh, to a place that will take us ultimately into the land of promise. 
We may have an Egypt in our, because of famine that comes in our life, because of lack, because of need, because something goes haywire in our life. But God, it didn't surprise God. Uh, God saw that. But he, it's like telling the disciples and Jesus told them to cross over to the other side. They, there were storms all over that place, but they crossed over to the other side. On the other side, when they got there, was demon-possessed people who were blessed when Jesus showed up. Hey, let me tell you something. There's people in need on the other side and if we don't go on the other side, how are they going to be, needs going to be met? That's why God has to have the compass to direct our lives to where we need to go. To, to, uh, to let us anchor our, our soul in the haven of rest. God's got to have the, the compass to get us there. And if we don't follow him, we'll go to the wrong place. Amen? And so when you think about all that stuff, you think about all that God has promised and all that God has prospered, and you think about a man like Abraham. Now, God didn't know where in there tell me to be like Abraham except Abraham's faithfulness. He wants all men to be faithful. He wants all men to be faithful as he speaks to us in our homeland. Now, I, I, I've tried to figure that thing out. Uh, I mean, not figure it out in a sense uh, because it's been a long time ago when God did all this. It's been hundreds and thousands of years ago uh, since God spoke to Abraham and spoke to his family and, and gathered up all his stuff and they, he went on his journey. But it was in his homeland that he, I'll tell you, where we are is not where we want to be. Uh, it, our homeland is not where we want to be. We want to be in the promised land. And, and getting to the promised land is, 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 is what we're talking about tonight. But we got we got to talk about where it started. Now, I can imagine a, a normal family uh, in the normal of their day, I can imagine a normal family receiving such a word. I, I've often thought about Noah. My Lord, what would you have thought if God had come to you and said, build me an ark? He'd say, for what? <laughs> I mean, he'd never seen a ship, never seen an ark, never seen rain. And here it is, God's telling him, build me an ark. And build it this size, build it this high, build it this wide, build these compartments into it, and then uh, tar and pitch it and shut it up, and then I'll close the door and it'll be done. But see, here's what, here's what he didn't know in the beginning. That very ark would be the haven for his family. That very ark would be the place that would save the lives of his family. And that's what you and I don't know. The very thing we do in the day may save the, the life and redeem our kinsmen. They redeemed them from hell in what we're doing here tonight. Yeah, some people look and say, look at them fools gathered there in that church. But I'm telling you, look at them fools who refused to gather. Amen. Amen. Hey, we just don't know. I bet when you think about all that, you think about Abram. Abram led his people to deliverance, even though he, he led them through some hardship. Hey, I'll tell you right now, God put his mighty hand on him, but it, it all started in his homeland. That's where God, has God spoken to you? I mean, you, you're the only one that knows. Was it God? Is it God speaking to you? Or do you desire something so much you say, say it's God speaking to you? Do you want God to justify where you are now so that you can say it was God? You see, that's, that's the whole deal. We do that often. We do that without even thinking about that we're doing it to justify where we are. Oh, I would have been there, but so, so was sick. It, uh, they were telling me about the Sunday school class this morning. That's it, making excuses, you know, trying to, trying to justify where we are. Let me tell you something. There is no justification. We, we surrender to God in the homeland, and then we go to a place where he will tell us and take us. We go to the place of blessing, and that'll be, you know, the Bible said Abraham believed God. Did you know that? Abraham believed God, and because he believed God, what happened? And, and we read in Genesis chapter 12 of the blessings that would come because he believed God, we, because he obeyed God. Believing's not enough. Obeying. We, and see, that's it. If he'd have stayed in his homeland, if he'd have hated to get out of the house he just built or the land he just bought, if he'd have hated to go, I'm telling you, he would have missed the blessing. His name would not have been in Hebrews chapter 11. We don't have to say if Abraham was a faithful man who believed God. That's all we need to know. Uh, what are they going to say about us? Well, they're gonna, that little thing's going to keep flipping up there at the funeral home or out here at church wherever we have your body in the state or my body, and everybody's going to say, oh, I remember that picture. Oh, I, oh, I never saw I never knew him when that picture was made. We're going to talk about all the things we knew about that picture, but I'm going to tell you something. God's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what, that's what I want to see. That little thing flopping on the wall over there is just trying to be a comfort to the family, trying to get them through the moment, trying to get them through the hour. I'm telling you right now, but don't you fret. Don't you worry about me, my family. I want you to 
no, you don't need to flash my pictures on the wall. You just need to preach the sermon I preached this morning when I'm gone. Glory be to God. You need to preach and lead people out of this wilderness and out of this place. Get them out of the homeland. And have them a relationship with God. Get out of the homeland and march on to the promised land because there is a promised land. Amen. Amen. Beulah land, I think they call it. Somewhere in the Bible and in the song. Beulah land that we've heard about. I remember when I first heard that song, Beulah land. Mr. Tom Nance had died, and his grandson stood to the pulpit and sang Beulah Land. I thought I would have a spell, uh, and that was many years ago, but it, it's an awesome song. Abraham, in his homeland, received the call of God. Started out on a journey. You see, there's nothing in the Bible about him until God spoke to him in his homeland. Did y'all know that? Great plan. God has a great plan, and you are part of that plan. And he'll speak to you in the homeland to get you in the plan. And to lead you and guide you and direct you and influence and touch the lives of people all the way through your journey. He'll, he'll touch people and you'll be remembered by the people that you touch. You, you'll be remembered. I, I've got people, I've got stories I can tell you. I, at West Lumberton Baptist Church. I, I was there and the, and the church was packed. It's not that new building you see from the interstate up there now. It was an old building they were in at the time. But it was packed out. I'm telling you, uh, that, that guy for Bell from up there somewhere in Robinson County sang every night. There was just a great spirit of singing. There was a great spirit of worship. And then we preached, and there was a great spirit of preaching. God's uh, spirit just fell down on the preaching, and the altars were filled up. I'll never forget a man who come with his, grand, his mother in his arms, 81 years old, and set her down on the altar, wanting to be saved. I won't ever forget it. And there were people everywhere. He couldn't hardly get her there. I remember the man right over who raised his hand and said, Preacher, can you get to me. I want to be saved. I don't want to die in my sin. Somehow or another we made it. I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like it in my life. I'm getting goosebumps tonight thinking about it. And people getting saved. People say you can't get saved after sin. Hey, I'm telling you, they got saved there, bless God. Holy Ghost come down there. When you're on that journey, God will do some wonderful and miracles in your life and give you things that will feed you when there ain't much happening going on in your life. Amen. Sometimes I need to remember that. Sometimes I need to hear that and, and to recount that story over and over and over again. 36 people got saved, gave their heart to Jesus Christ, old and young. And I'll tell you right now, what a glorious memory I have as I've gone on my journey. How many memories did Abraham have when he went on his journey? The Lord said, look up into the sky and the stars. Your, your descendants will be more than the stars. I'll bless you to be father of nation. Hey, you'll be it because you obeyed me. That's that journey. That's that trip we call life. You think your life matters? Yeah, it ain't just black lives that matter. Lives matter. Your life matters. Your life is important in, in your journey to get to the promised land. You're somewhere right now, I pray, between the home, your homeland and the promised land. Yeah, you may be in your Egypt right now. You know, Egypt's not a good place to be. I've been there. I've been there. I, I've been all out in the deserts in, in, in Egypt. I just, I've just seen stuff there that I never thought I'd ever see from studying that history that I used to study. I never dreamed I'd get to see the Giza pyramids. And I, I never get to hear that music floating across the desert there as they, they played out there and them, play, and them uh, belly dancers are dancing that, that stuff. Never dreamed. The Sphinx, Sphinx or whatever they call that thing. That, uh, you know, the Nile River used to flow by and, and they had a shift in the continental shelf and that Nile River don't flow by there no more. It flows way out yonder somewhere. But what I'm trying to tell you is I never dreamed that I, I but in Egypt, it's not a place I'd want to build a house and live. You know there's been a lot of chaos there even in our generation. But the generations before us when the Pharaohs ruled, you know there was much oppression even to the children of God. There was much oppression against Israel after Joseph died and was remembered no more. You know that the Pharaohs persecuted them and they caused them to work harder than they should have worked. They beat them and they killed them and they abused them and God delivered them. And God will deliver us in our lifetime. We may be in our Egypt right now, but we don't have to stay there or die there. Let me tell you something about our life when we live our life in obedience to God. We may have to go into Egypt. Y'all listening? We may have to go into Egypt, but when we come out, we'll bring their jewels and their gold to take us on our way home. 
Y'all listen to me? God will take all their riches and we'll put them on our life. And they'll give them willingly uh, when we take our exit out of there. What did the man do to Abraham? And he, I'm telling you, he told him, get on your way. I want you out of here. He gave him stuff to get him out of there. He told the, uh, his soldiers, protect them on their way out. I'm telling you right now, when we're in the will of God, people won't, even the enemies of God will help us on our way. That's what we miss. That's what we miss. God will use. And that's what happened to Abraham. Even though Abraham was wrong in, in, in being afraid, see? Abraham had days. Are you afraid sometimes because the storms get so dark? Are you afraid sometimes? I, I've told you all, in the inland waterway down yonder at, at, over there at Sunset Beach, I'm telling you, I saw, the, I saw the cloud today when the parted sea, according to what they show us, I, I seen that cloud in that waterway that day. Me and Michelle, I, I think Chassie said she was with I thought I would die. I thought I would die. I'm telling you, never seen anything. I, we didn't have these cell phones with photographs and all that mess on. I wish I had some pictures of it. You wouldn't believe it. If I could show, it was just rolling and tumbling and rolling and tumbling and coming right down that waterway right to me. I didn't know what I was going to do. My, my old motor wouldn't crank. I'll tell you, like that, <laughs> I'd like to have a heart attack. Michelle said, Daddy, Daddy, look, Daddy, look. We got to get out of here. And, and we, I was doing everything I could. I believe I could have jumped up on the water and walked that boat out of there. Amen. But God will take care of you. That's what I wanted you to see. God will take care of you, even in that storm. Even in life, when we move out of the homeland, when God speaks, you know, in Columbus County, when I got out of high school, I had made a commitment to the National Guard. The National Guard, I, you could join at 18. Or I, I think I had joined the National Guard. I had been to a summer camp with them anyway, some training camp down there in Georgia. I had been in that long. I think I had about a year's service in the National Guard. And when I knew when I got out of high school, which was in May, we used to get out at the end of May, uh, which was in May, I, I, I had a contract that I either had to go on to boot camp, which was six months down there, or do something. So I decided to do something. And so for the first time in my life, for a period of time, I left North Carolina. I left my family. I left everything that was familiar to me, and I left, and I went. And I want to tell you, on the outside, you'd have thought I was cool as a cucumber. But on the inside was fear and doubt and whether or not, how in God's name was I going to make it. For you see, there were three of us who started that journey and, and the other two chickened out. When it came time, they chickened out. I was the only one left. As I traveled to Raleigh on a bus to get on that airplane, that would take me ultimately to Great Lakes, Illinois. I, the fear bubbled up in me. I, and, and I'd sit over there and a tear would run down my eye. No, I didn't want nobody to see it. When I got up there and stood in that gate and saw all those people in there, people that I'd never seen, that I didn't know, what were they going to do to me? I, I had a feeling and a longing and a burning and a desire uh, for, for my family back at home. You see, I couldn't wait to get away. I couldn't wait. To get, but I'm going to tell you something. Ain't it? That's the story of all kids, it seems like, most of them. They just want to get away. They want to get out from under the thumb. They want to get out from under somebody else telling them what to do. But there'll come a day when you want to get back under. You want to get back under and be where uh, they wanted you to be in the first place. That's exactly what God wants you to be under his wing. That Jesus told us that when he said, I would have gathered you like a mother hen or chicks. It's under the wing that, that our protection comes. And see, Abraham was under the wing because Abraham believed God. Abraham heard God in the homeland and Abraham went on the journey. You see, the Lord didn't tell him to take Lot, but he took Lot. Y'all know what happened. You know how that became an issue. You know, you know how that became an issue down the road. He, I mean, he, he told him, get away from your family. Get away from your people. Get away from your homeland. And I'm going to guide you on your journey and take you on the way. That's what he told him. What God sometimes tells us to do in a worldly, earthly sense does not make sense. It seems like, is this God telling me this? Well, God don't want, he don't want us to make, he don't want to make sense with what man thinks and how man thinks it ought to be done. God don't want, hey, if God, if it's not something you can't explain, it's not of God. Because you, now you can go on Google and Google anything. If you need a definition, you can Google. If you need a scripture verse, you can Google it. Go Google. You, there's no reason you don't know anything you want to know. It's on Google now. 
Just get right on there, Google it right up, and it'll tell you somebody's age, how much money they make, what their grandma's name is, and all the young. Hey, look here, you can find out all kinds of stuff now. You can find out who is and who ain't. You can find out all kinds of stuff. So there's no reason for us to be in the But I'm going to tell you something. Abraham packed up, and according to what I read, uh, Brother Buck, you probably know this, and you that read the Bible know this, he had quite much possessions. He had quite much possessions as well as animals and livestock. And then Lot had his big old crowd, and then they all had servants. Then she, they had handmaidens and all that. We know they had handmaidens because his wife had one that he ultimately had a child with. And so there was chaotic things in, in this journey, in this life. And there, it, it all started out to, with that way. It all started out because the stage was set in the beginning for it to be that way. Sometimes we take too much stuff with us when we're going, leaving the homeland to go. When I left my homeland, I really wanted to be back. I really wanted to be back. I wonder, I don't think there might have been, but I wonder if Abraham ever looked at the sunset and said, wow, if I could just be back in the homeland. I don't know that he did. I think maybe his faith might have overridden that had he had a thought like that. But I don't think God would have killed him if he had because sometimes this journey that we're on gets hard. Sometimes the, the drawing and the attraction of, of the circumstance that are around us cause us to sin, cause us to think about these things and cause us to do what we ought not to do on that journey of faith that we entered into and we get sidetracked. We have to get an Egypt come up in our life and we get all gommed up and all messed up. But God is there. God is there. I won't ever forget Elijah running from, uh, what's her face? Jezebel. Here's a man that called fire down from heaven. I mean, the people said it, it saw it happen and cheered for God. I mean, just, it lapped up water. I, you know what I think that was? Probably lightning. God probably sent a, a strike of lightning and just, it just fried that water right up off that altar and the sacrifice that was laid there. I mean, as wet as they could wet it, it weren't too wet that God couldn't dry it off. See, that's what, that's what God did to Gideon. He, he turned the cloth any way you want to turn it. You want me to rain on it or, or drop frost on it or not? Whatever you want, need to do, I'll do it, Gideon, so you'll get up off this threshing floor, leave the comfort zone, and go on out there and, over, and take, the, take them people and kill them. Uh, you're the general, man. You've got to get on up there. Hey, what do you need me to show you to tell you that you uh, where I want you to go? Abraham, look at the other, look at the opposite of that. He said, "I'll take you where you a land you don't know about. <laughs> I'll take you to a place you've never seen, and I'll give it to you as a possession. But you you don't know where it is, and I'll tell you when you need to be told. What about that kind of life? There are people who live that. There are people who live that life today. They people who are missionaries in foreign countries have one soul saved in twenty years." It's almost hard to believe that. But they do. They go to lands where you can't even talk about Jesus to talk about Jesus. They go into lands and, and they go over there and spend. You heard a pastor from Tabor City say that they shot at him, put a contract out on him to kill him. Shot in his truck and, and the ricocheted and some of the shrapnel went off and hit his child sitting there in the seat beside him. Cobras crawling into the thatched roof of his house where he had to live. Come on, people. That would have been enough for me to tear the bushes up to get back out there. Amen. Oh, uh -uh. I know if I wanted to stay with Judy, I'd have had to left because she sure would have been gone. Amen. And so when you think about all that stuff, think about what people go through. Yeah, that's obedience to God. That's obedience to God. They made it through. God kept them. God gave grace and God kept them. God gave Abraham grace and God kept him. Abraham delivered Lot how many times? Abraham went over there and fought the kings that had taken his family. Hey, you ain't going to put up with your stuff. Leave my family alone. Abraham's prayer saved Lot. I can tell you all right now. Abraham it was a man whose prayers have saved us. I'll tell you, because of his commitment, the blessing in Abraham is my blessing because that's what the Scripture says. The Scripture says, and those who bless you will I bless, and we bless it. Amen. Thank God. I'm telling you right now, this is good preaching right here. You need, you need to listen. You need to hear what saith the Lord to us tonight. And so it said, Abraham, uh, he called to go out into a place when he obeyed God. Now, have you ever disobeyed God? Yeah, we do. Hey, but we ought not to take it so casually. You know, anymore, it's all right to disobey God. It's not all right ever to disobey God. Never. It's never all right for a child not to obey their parents. The Bible says children obey your parents. 
Every time you disobey, you're disobeying the word of God. It's just that plain, just that simple. I can show it to you kids. It's right in the book. And every time you, you it don't matter if they're there and, you, and their back's turned or not. If you disobey them, you're sinning against You're sinning against God and you're sinning against them. It's right there in the book. Children, obey your parents. Isn't that what it says? It sure does say that. And it's right there. It's in, it's in black and white in the Word of God. And so, uh, I mean, it, that, that, this obedience uh, is what's going to get you through this journey we call life. Uh, the other day, uh, one my cousin died, and I didn't even know he was dead until after the fact. Uh, but he's, he's the oldest living ward that I know of out of my family. He lived to be 80 years old. 80 years old. Uh, my, all my, uh, my daddy's uncles and my great uncles, they were dying in their 70, 71, 72. All the Stanleys died of heart disease. And, but look here, I don't run around fretting. I've already passed 70, 71, 72. Hey, but look here, when I was going through there, I was saying, well, is that going to be my ticket? Hey, God didn't call me on that journey. They, they live like hell and live like heathens. I'm the son of God, amen. The curse is broken. Walking, walking in grace, walking by faith. Hey, I'm not going to. And so I thought about that, though. Hey, my, his daddy was a good man. Went, went and laid down one afternoon after church after dinner and died. Didn't never wake up. Good man. In fact, Roger and some of y'all might have went to the funeral. His wife, Aunt Lizzie Mae, when she died, I preached her funeral when I was over at Carolina. I just want to tell y'all something. God, in his, in his way, stuff like that weighs on you. Their families. Some people grow up and don't want to be like their family. Try to try to for, ask God to break the curse of the family they they've been born into. There's so much, what you want to call it. I don't know what the word is. There's so much going on in that family. God help me not to be like my family. But deliver me, deliver me from my family. Send me to a place away from my family that I can be your child. Amen. Y'all. Don't, no, y'all don't even understand what I'm talking about, do you? But I'm going to tell you, there's somewhere, or other, you just need to get on a, take your car if you've got a good car, get some good tires on it, get it serviced, and drive around America. Drive around America and see America. See the real world. Not this little podunk place down here that we grew up in. Hey, get out there when you see the fences and you see all that stuff's going on. You think it's bad here? Hey, what about the kids that got shot by the people they know in Chicago this weekend? Huh? Yeah, you think it's bad? Why don't you go over there and uh, we got a team in Uruguay over there right there, or Nicaragua right now that, that are going to children out on a dump. That's where they live. Out on a dump. They eat out of a dump. And they're over there trying to help them. Hey, kids, you think you got it bad? You need to see the rest of the world, the rest of the country. And we need to be obedient to God because all God's doing when he's trying to get us out of our comfortness at home is to teach us and bring us to the promised land. Ain't that something? See, Abraham went over there, and you know what? When he got there, guess what? That was the very place God wanted him to be. That was the promised land. He got there, and it forever. Hey, look here. I don't care if Mr. Obama, whoever else is in, in power up there in Washington, D.C., it's ever the children of God's land over there. They ain't never going to kick them off no more. You hear me? They can send our army, their army, and all the armies. God ain't going to beat God, and I can show you that, where the blood flows so deep. Men could drown in the blood of the enemies of the children of God. Hey, we're not going to take that land, so stay out of it and quit provoking God's people there. Amen. Now, see, how, what's it going to take for us to wake up? What's it going to take for us to see? What's it going to take? It's going to take... I reckon God knocking our heads around a little bit, amen? And he can do that too. He's pretty good. He's pretty good at that. Somebody said to me this morning, boy, I read in the Bible, God killed a lot of people. I believe that was Sister Sherry, wasn't it? God said God killed a lot of people. He sure did. Read that Old Testament. Boy, I'll tell you, it weren't just a few. Y'all remember when the earth opened up and swallowed up 250, weren't it 250? Wasn't that something? took one big breath and just opened her mouth. We, we see a sinkhole every once in a while. A car fell in it like that the other day. I saw one. They were all amazed. What about when the man standing there on the porch in, the, in front of the man of God uh, trying, hey, Cora, uh, hey, he opened up his mouth and come over there to, to get in the face of the man of God. God said, well, hold on a minute, Cora. I got a little something for you. He peeled it back and dropped him. I read that every day. That's it. 
That's in the book of, that I read every day in my Bible. Every day I read about Korah. You see, we can, there's Korahs right, right here on this earth. There's Korahs you work with that you can follow and go up and contest what God said if you want to. You know what will happen, amen? You're going to fall into Korah's manhole there that swallowed him up. We need to learn this stuff. We need to learn and know that our journey is going to be full of that stuff. What if there was nobody that you ever could, that you had to, could be confronted by? Yeah, I mean, there's not a person. I've never met a person yet that's perfect. I met a whole bunch that thought they were. But there, there's not any. I know people that think they know everything and know just what to say and will stand you down and get mad with you if you disagree with them. I've got, I know a lot of them people. Think, they, they think they know everything. But I want you to know one thing. There's only one that I know that knows everything. And the Bible says he's all-knowing, and that's God. <laughs> hey, amen. He's omniscient. Hey, he's everywhere, omnipresent. He's everywhere, omniscient. He knows everything. Omnipotent, he has all power. He, he just has it all. He's the one that said, leave your homeland. So we got to go. That's salvation. That's where, that's where we come to him. What did the fishermen do, Buck? They left their boat. They left their homeland. What did the tax man do? He left his collection booth. And went and followed him to a place. He was going to a place. When we get called by God, we're going somewhere, folks. He, he's pulled up like pulling up in a limo and saying, get on. We're fixing to take a ride here on a journey. You can't be in your comfort zone. You can't be there. You got to be in God's comfort zone for you. You got to walk with him. It's his call, his life he wants you to live, his will he wants you to walk in, his way he's illuminated for you, his word that he has inspired. Hey, I'm telling you, it's all about God and it ain't about you. Amen. And so Abraham realized that. And what did he do? He went on his way. Now, isn't that simple? What do you think? What if Abraham said no? Well, we don't really have to discuss that. He didn't. People do say no, Blake, to God. You know what? You're probably going to be a... I heard your daddy was mean as a snake playing football. You're probably going to be like him. You're probably going to be mean and big. And grab people and throw them on you. Throw them this way. Throw them that way. And rawr, you're going to be a, yeah. Let me tell you about a young man I met. He probably stood about 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. Probably about that big at the shoulders. Big old fella. Nice and like a big old fella. And he was at a meeting that we went to, he was giving his testimony. He went to this thing where the NFL players, potential NFL players, uh, go to try out. He was a field goal kicker. Handsome young fella. Graduated from college. Went through all that. He could kick that football 55 yards on a windy day. Threw them uprights. I mean, he's just a candidate you would think. Would have, would have made. He said on that day that he went, Minnesota Vikings looked at him. <laughs> it, the wind, I forgot, he told how fast the wind was blowing. He said, but I, gentlemen, I cooked three field goals. The longest was 55 yards into a wind. And he said, never have I been so confounded when they said we're not interested in you, we cut you. He said, but let me tell you something. Down the road, I found out why I got cut. Because God had somewhere else for me. That, see, that's the deal about listening and obeying God. Being willing when doing something like that. I mean, you had your, he had his hopes on it. He just knew when, he, when that happened that day. He felt so good and a little bit of pride welled up in him. That pride was broken and cut down when they said, no, we don't want you. They chose someone else. He called the man's name. Said so they chose someone else instead of choosing me. I was flabbergasted. You know, have you ever been flabbergasted that somebody didn't choose you because you thought your impression of yourself was that you were better than others and you could do a better job? Well, I want you to know God knows who can do the better job. And God does the choosing. 
And when he chooses you and has a place for you to go, why not just say, yes, Lord, I'm going to go. I'm going to walk by faith and trust you. Along that journey there, as, as everything pressed, I don't know about you, I, it ain't been all stars and stripes for me. Uh, how about y'all? Has everything been hunky-dory for you in your life so far? If it has, raise your hand. You see, we didn't get a real rush of hands being raised up because life and the things that life brings to us and the circumstances and situations we get in is not easy. But that don't mean that don't mean because it's not easy. That don't mean that we don't keep on keeping on. Amen? That don't mean that we give up because we're not to the promised land yet. And I want to tell you all something. That's why that scripture says, for those who endure to the end will be saved. Abraham, if he'd have stayed in Egypt, he wouldn't have made it to the land of promise. I mean, that's just a fact. He wouldn't have made it. Have y'all ever thought about this and, and really thought about it? Here you got several million people who have been over there in Egypt. They have been beaten. They've been under taskmasters. They've been, all these things have happened to them, all these bad things. God sends somebody over there to lead them out of there. And they get out of there. And what's the first thing they began to do? They want to go back. See, to them, they were born over there. Y'all know that, right? Many of them were born because the people that went over there was just a few. That was the family of Joseph. The family of jo His father and his brothers are the people that went over there, and they, they began to multiply in there. They multiplied up into the millions over there in them 400 years in Egypt. I mean, 400 begat 400, and before you know it, 800 begot 8, and before you know it, you had a multitude of the people of God in slavery and in bondage. Many of them, as soon as they got out of there, said, what did you do? Bring us out here to die in this wilderness? Bam! God kills about 25 of them and says, uh, what were you saying? Yeah, that's what happened. He said he killed more than 20,000. That's what happened. He said all, everybody that was over a certain age died in that wilderness because they weren't willing to go on with that journey that God had called them out of and called them to. He called them, he didn't call them to the wilderness, he called them through the wilderness to get to the land of promise. I've been in that Sinai Peninsula. I've been all over the deserts out there. I'm telling you right now, I was there, I saw the place. Hey, I know they got weary. I know that they, they, did, they wondered, but I'm telling you, God is bigger than wonder. God is awesome, and God will do what he said he'll do. He'll take you to the promised place. If we'll just leave our homeland and leave all that stuff we've been thinking. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, I wish we'd had a church full tonight. I'll tell you what I'd be willing to wager you. That if we had some top ten singer in gospel music, you couldn't get a sing here tonight. Guarantee you. We promoted it. You couldn't get a seat in here tonight. I guarantee you, if we get somebody from the Alabama Theater or the Carolina Opera, you come in here, you wouldn't find a seat. Free pizza for so on and so forth. I'm telling you, what in the world is wrong with people? What in the world is wrong? The old country preacher used to come, and every time you saw him, he'd have on the same suit, more than likely, and the same necktie with a clean white shirt and a T-shirt under it. One of them. He preached till he was wet and completely worn out, and he'd go home with nothing in his pocket. But I'm telling you one thing, they appreciated him. They appreciated the word. And when he come back, he sometimes had four and five churches. Sometimes he only had two. But when he'd come back, they were glad to see him come back. Today, it's just the opposite. After a deliverance and a word like God sent to this church this morning, wouldn't you have thought tonight that it would have been packed? Wouldn't you have thought it? I mean, wouldn't you? A move of the Spirit of God like he moved in here this morning. What happened to it? Let me tell you what happened. 
Satan came and gnawed away and gnawed away the blessing. That's why our journey is so hard. Amen? That's why we end up in places we ought not to be. Guys, whatever's coming to you is going to be by your sowing. You will reap what you sow. Abraham sowed faith and faith was reaped. At the end of his journey, I'm telling you, father of many nations, he obeyed God. If we obey God, God will bless and prosper. There's not anything. Not will he only bless and prosper. He will bless our children and prosper our children. I mean, really, what in the world is it going to take? What in the world? We had our time with some of our family, not all of them, but some of them were there this afternoon. I went up to the house and just looked through some scripture and stuff. I was going, and, and then I turned on the TV and it, there was a golf tournament and people were just standing and pressing to get close. I mean, a multitude. It's like that the soccer game was on and the, and the Wimbledon Championship, Wimbledon Tennis Championship, and people were massing by the thousands. I guarantee you the beach down there is like they're sown in the sand. The entertainment centers, are, yeah, you have to stay through three or four lights to get to the next light. But yet people are there. What happened to the, the serenity and the beauty of worship and following God? happened to that the blessedness of church Sherry and Ronnie living in the Carolina community the old church building used to, was in the woods and now it's gone but they remember the days that children were marched from the school to the re revival in fact that building I think school and church was held in that building I don't know but you think about stuff like that what happened to those days we used to teach our children, at, hey, kids, we're going to have a break now. We go into revival. We got revival to this morning. We're having preaching and prayer at our church. We want you all to be quiet now, and we march them over there. What happened to all that stuff? You know what happened? We don't have men like Abraham no more. We don't have people like Abraham who's, who leave the homeland for the benefit of others to go to a land of promise, a land of blessing. That's exactly why. Our sacrifice is really putrid in the nostrils of God. God don't want our sacrifice. He wants our obedience. He said obedience is better than sacrifice. I, Abraham, you know, I'm not going to get in or out because of what Abraham done. Y'all listening to me? I'm going to get in on what God's done through Jesus Christ. And whether or not I believe that and live like I believe it and gone where he sent me. I'm going to get in on what God has done in me and not what he's doing for my mama that's already there and already gone. I'm going to get there because Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary and remembered me. And while he didn't scream out my name, he remembered me. He died for the sins of the whole world. That included me. How about you? So I promise you right now, these difficulties will bring tears. They'll bring heartaches. They'll bring loads of burdens. But Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Man. I got a dog down there at my house. I won't cure that dog sometimes. No, I, I don't really want to, but that they'll jump up on the food box and knock the food on the floor. And it's not eatable. It gets wet and not, gets in the water and mess. But that's their food. That's their food. And they're barking and playing across the pens. They're not, they're not doing that intentionally. They don't notice you have to go buy that stuff and it costs this much money. They're just doing what a dog does, barking, right? Playing, carrying on until they grow up a little bit. 
Then they buy it. Oh. And I, I have to remember that. that the first time I ever saw that dog, she tried to bite me. I guess she's, I, she hadn't learned yet. That, and I talked to her, and she'll hang her head. I said, All right, look at the food on the floor. Who's the stupid one in that conversation? That dog's smart. I'm glad nobody sneaks up there and puts the camera on it and lets nobody else see it. I mean, really. Here I am talking to a dog. And, and you know, she'll go around the corner and stick her head down just like she's here. And, and but the reality of it all, time now, least she jumps back up and barks and there goes the food on the thing again. Listen to me. I could share about my life, but it might be boring to you. You could share about yours, and it might be the same for me. But look here, the Lord knows, and it ain't boring to him. He knows what we're going through. He knows where we, what we've gone through. He knows where we are, are today and what we're going through. And he knows that he wants us to go to the promised land. Do you want to go? Are you on the way? What challenging have you been through tonight that so far? Has it been a challenge of obedience? Are you obeying God? Or has it been a challenge of disobedience where you got out there and gotten something because you weren't obeying God? See, that happened a lot. That's why he needed Abraham. He chose Aaron. He chose the plains and chose Sodom and Gomorrah. And before you knew it, he was all, his family was all wrapped up, Brother Buck, and all this stuff. I asked a guy the other day, I said, Where did you still ride? No, I sold that motorcycle. I got this or that. And now uh, people go from one thing to another. He went and bought him a boat. Now, see, that's what we do. We go from one thing to another. And I guess that thing's all right. If he didn't want the motorcycle, that's all right. But if either one of them keeps him from going to that place where God says go, you don't need it. It's destructive for you. So I want to ask you tonight, there's a cloud of buzzing out there. Y'all hear it? It's a buzzing. Storms are buzzing. I want to share with you the latest I got on Brother Roger. And I can tell you right now, his heart is right here. If I could somehow or another tune up with him and get him to where we are, listen. Well, that's a group. I don't want no group. Excuse me. I'm trying to help and give you an accurate update of this stuff. And I can't get this thing to work. Ain't that something? All right, here we go. You ready? Okay, here's the latest. He has three clots, two in the lung, one in the leg. They found blood in his stool. Dr. Greco will scope him on Tuesday. He has to be off the blood thinner for a day. This is from Dr. Gonzalez. That's his doctor, okay? At least it will allow us to rule out colon cancer as a potential cause for his DVT slash PE. That's where Roger is. Now, he went to the doctor with a, with a hip problem, and I think they've had some trouble with the blood pressure up and down, that kind of thing, recently. So far, we've got these clots. They, I don't think they determined yet where they might be coming from, but he's got two in his lungs and one in his leg. Who knows what else they're going to find? But I'll tell you what I do know. He's trusting the Lord. He's trusting the Lord tonight. He's not laying up there gasping for breath or sick to the point of death, it don't seem. But he's a faithful man. In all the years I've known him, he's faithful. He's quiet. I miss him sitting out there in that chair. He's always been an ambassador for cooperation. Ever since I've known him, he's not one that likes a lot of upheaval and a lot of confusion in the church. And neither am I. But that's just the kind of man he is. He didn't know that he wasn't going to be here today. He didn't know that he was going to have all this stuff was coming. 
and you don't know what's coming to you and I don't know what's coming to me. Sherry mentioned about her heart attack after her heart attack saying, I remember that day of that heart attack. I remember the, how the cloud rolled. I mean, awful cloud I've ever seen in my life. Water standing on the road between here and Wilmington, I had to get out sometimes, stop. But her ambulance kept right on going. Made it through the, the storm. We got there and there she is, all grinny and smiley, already been in there and done their thing. You see, and we were out there in the storm. God will bring you through your storm. Amen. He's going to bring Brother Roger through his storm. And he's going to bring you through your storm. That's all a part, merely, of getting to the promised land. Ain't that, ain't that something? There ain't that something for us just to think about tonight. Thank you. Y'all who get us a song here. Uh, we're going to have our invitation. And I hope that maybe something's been said to help you. If you struggled, I mean, if you're struggling right now with something, if you struggled, and you really, you really need a, a helping hand. Or if you've seen struggle in other people, if you look around, you can see it. If you've seen other people struggle, if you've seen things going on and you were thankful that they weren't going on with you, give thanks to God. But if you need a helping hand tonight, if you need anything from God tonight, he's big enough to help you. And I just ask you to let him. Would you please stand with me?